voertuig bestuur, wat doen jy as jy by die slaggate kom? Gospodin Rogachov, kak daar wou vidit uh, jam in de roger, sto wou delit? Ja, as nou na gas. Sto wou praskatjit po bestuur. Hy reif in die gerdan. <laughs> I, I assume you have a 4x4. <laughs> Word daar ook rugby in Rusland gespeel? Yeah, but it is being implemented and we really? have quite a number of South African players and I think uh, coaches as well in, mm-hmm. in Russia mm-hmm. uh, who are in the, well, our Premier League, of course, and, and uh, yes, so the, uh, the sports is on. Absolutely. Good. But, but, but we would welcome more, more assistance in this. Because we, the Russian society supported Boers in the war against the Brits. But uh, later we have uh, found ourselves on uh, different sides of the bar- barricades, so to speak. Again, it is very important uh, mm-hmm. to understand. Mm-hmm. It was not uh, the war uh, between Russians and the Boers. Mm-hmm. Let's not confuse interstate relationship and a relationship between the two peoples. Absolutely. It was uh, the war um, uh, of the socialist system against uh, the f- former colonial system and uh, against apartheid regime. And it so happened that uh, one of us was on one side and another one on the other side. But uh, that, that shouldn't uh, be transferred uh, to you know, and should be allowed to spoil the relationship between the two peoples. No, it's in Afrikaans and, and Russian. And Russian, you, yes. There is no English. Yes, there's no English. And this is not a mistake. <laughs> no. uh, very few people in South Africa know it, uh, that um, uh, the secondary school for girls called Rania in Bloemfontein, it was established uh, and uh, it was uh, built and operated in early uh, 19, uh, 20th century, 1902 to 1917, until the Great October Socialist Revolution. But it was built and operated on the, you know, the funds allocated by the uh, Russian Imperial Court. Uh, so we got rid of this, we got rid of the communist ideology, we got rid of the uh, communist system, and um, uh, that was the major uh, change politically from uh, what used to be in the USSR. Well, democracy is just one of the uh, formats, one of the forms of uh, mm-hmm. self-organization of uh, a society. Mm-hmm. Who said that it's necessarily the best one? Ons is hier by die Russiese ambassade hier in Pretoria en ons gaan onder het voer met die Russiese ambassadeer. Ek sit nou hier so saam met meneer Ilya Rogachev. Privet, Mr. Rogachev. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Dabro pajalot. You are very welcome here. Ons gaan in die begin uh, net gauw eers... Uh, een snel vier vraag afdeling het, waar tijdens ons iemand gaan vraag, wat hier in die Russische ambassade werk om vir ons te help om die vertaling te doen, want ons wil het baie graag vir julle wees, die verskil tussen Afrikaans en Russies. En uh, ons gaan met ander woorde die eerste paar vraag wat ons vir meneer Rokatjov gaan vraag, gaan ons vir hom in Afrikaans vraag, en dit gaan vertaal word na hom in Russies toe. Maar, but before we continue with the questions, your personal questions that we have for you, Mr. Rokajov, is, uh, can you just give us a brief history of how did it happen, when did you start your career in, uh, in uh, politics, and, uh, and yeah, a little bit more about yourself. Thank you, thank you for asking. Uh, it's uh, rather in diplomacy than in politics. I'm, I'm not there yet. Uh, no, so I, I began my diplomatic career in 1984, quite some time ago, just as I graduated from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, just like many generations of Soviet and Russian and uh, the diplomats from other countries. But you also had a role in the United Nations? Uh, I was posted twice to the Russian permanent mission to the United Nations, so I worked for the government. <clears throat> now, what does that kind of uh, what does that do? What, what do you do there? I know it's diplomacy, but what kind of work? Do I, I'm, ju- I'm just curious because we Boers, we just want to find out whether you use a spade or are you just driving the bucket to let the 
corrupt girl. Mm, neither one. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's much worse. <laughs> it's, it's heavier. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, well, uh, I uh, covered um, some uh, legal issues and other legal human rights and so on. Uh, social affairs. Uh, both times uh, I spent uh, altogether nine years there. You can hear my Bronx accent. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Rogachev, what we're going to do now is we're going to ask Polina to come and join us here. Okay. So, Polina, if you don't mind, if you can come and join us here. Um, to our viewers, Polina, uh, Polina uh, Kulakova uh, is absolutely proficient in Afrikaans. Nou, kom, ek sê dit net geweer in Afrikaans. Sy kan Afrikaans baie mooi praat. En uh, Polina, jy kom uit Rusland uit, jy is een Rus gebore en jy praat Afrikaans. Ja, dis waar geet, maar, maar my Afrikaans is nie so professioneel nie. <laughs> nee, ons, ons gaan nie daar oor <laughs> maar klaar nie. Dit is baie mooi. Dit is, uh, ek gaan nie eers probeer om Russies te praat nie. Ek, bro, okay. ek, het, ek, ek probeer groet in Russies, maar dit is my op die stadium Grieks. <laughs> Polina, <coughs> Mr. Rogachev, Rogachev, I'm going to ask you the questions in Afrikaans now. You answer them in Russia and uh, we'll, we're going to use uh, Polina here to do the translation for us. <coughs> So hier is ons paar persoonlijke Afrikaanse vraag wat ons aan meneer Rogatjeef gaan vraag. As jy in Zuid-Afrika vakantie hou, wat er plekke besoek jy? Neskelijke liefde van Prosov, gospodin Rogatjeef, en pervo is nich, kada we adhaat in Juar, kakie mesta we posiesheid? No, abusna jy adhaat doma. Bolsho, tjesje, vse wo. Uh, gewoonlijk uh, is meneer Rogachev bij vakan- vakantie in Rusland. Niet in Zuid-Afrika niet, maar... Ah, nou, когда... Er is, geloof ik, niet veel mogelijkheden om te gaan met toerisme. Ik wil het graag hebben om meer tijd te hebben. Ongelukkig, daar is niet genoeg tijd om vakantie te uh, spenderen hier in Zuid-Afrika niet. Ну, я, конечно, посещал и Западный Кейп, и Восточный Кейп, и Фристейт, Лимпопу, по Малангу. Так что я немножко здесь поездил. Марек, хэт мультликейт хэхат ум рондом Сюдафрика Терейс. And before build, was ek in Лимпопу, in Пумаланга, in Уэс, in Вест Кап. Менер Рогачев, ин аси нау мэти фуртэх бэстир, Wat doen jy as jy by die slaggate kom? Gospodin Rogachev, kakda wy vidit uh, jamon de roge, što wy delit? Ja, žmo na gas. Što <laughs> bo proskačit po bestreje. Uh, hey, rey finneger dan. <laughs> I, I assume you have a 4x4. <laughs> Oké, okay. hoe voel die gemiddelde Russische burger oor Zuid-Afrika als een vakantiebestemming en hoe bekostigbaar is dit voor hulle middelklas om hier te kan kom vakantie hou? En als kolke dostupne mi vlijtse Jurna Afrika kak na provlenie la turizmu la sredni statistische oor Rasijanje? Ja, Доступно в целом, доступно. Но дело в том, что ЮАР имеет свою специфику как туристическое направление. Здесь неудобно путешествовать большими группами, как это принято во многих других случаях. По 40-50 человек вот этими огромными автобусами. Это скорее индивидуальный или туризм такой семейный в небольших группах. Uh, dit is beschikbaar, bekostigbaar om Russische mensen uh, Zuid-Afrika te gaan. Maar uh, dit is een specifieke bestemming. Uh, niet een grote groep gaan Zuid-Afrika toe als gewoonlijk. Uh, dit is niet een uh, richting of bestemming voor een grote groep van mensen, voor uh, 40 of 50 mensen te gaan. Zo so dit is uh, private toerisme of zoiets. Yeah, family tourism, so sort of. Mm. Ну и, конечно, самое большое неудобство это как как расплачиваться, чем платить, поскольку из-за санкций наши карты 
Многие заблокированы, и возить с собой большое количество кэша наличности неудобно. Я дихрутся к весе из меди контан, меди хелт, дес не хмаклик, он хирт батал, и русские семенцы могут хрутся саком от контанта край. Я понял. Ну, он кому свендет хобики айт. А у Ифон ях о фан фесвал. Давайте сменим тему разговора. Вы любите охоту или рыбалку? Я люблю, но у меня нет, не остается времени на них. Het boek of een flik, ne, wat je gelees of gekyk het, het jou geïnspireer en waarom? Kakaa kniga ili film was uh, vdachnavili kak datu? Ну, ну, это сложно сказать. Таких книг много и хороших фильмов немало. Я не, не могу назвать что-то одно. Вот. Ну, конечно, классическая русская литература прежде всего. Dus een boek is een beetje moeilijk om één boek of één flik uh, te noemen. Uh, daar is bij boeken en flikken dat uh, ik uh, kan en mag noemen. Uh, maar uh, om precies te wezen, uh, die klassieke Russische literatuur. <coughs> Zeg, waarom is nou precies het typische antwoord van een ambassadeur? <laughs> Niet het typische antwoord. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I said that's a typical answer of, the, of an ambassador, right? <laughs> Mr. Rogozhev. Um, heeft hij he, he al een bezoek op een plaats bij een boer in Zuid-Afrika in die platteland afgelee? En heeft hij al een paar uur samen met hulle gekeier om een braai vlees vier? Господин Рогачев, we когда либо были на бурской ферме в сельской местности и посещали браи вместе с бурами. Да, был несколько раз. Я минер Рогачев. Хоть сумха кир, бейди браи, ди браи бейха воин хэт мэт мэт буре уэк. Им Василь Хасфрей. Они были дружелюбны да. к отношению Они были очень дружелюбны. И это, я нахожу, что это очень приятное времяпрепровождение. Ja, Halle was uh, bij gasvrij en dit is uh, lekker tijd <laughs> om te spenderen in Zuid-Afrika. We in Russie ook doen ook een beetje schoenlijk. Het is ook een verschillendheid braai en ook een beetje schoenlijk en zitten in het ogen en zo verder. Ons geniet in Rusland ook braai of schoenlijk. Uh, ons noemen het schoenlijk niet braai niet. Uh, ons geniet ook bij die vuur te zitten en uh, geestels met mensen. Ons noemt het, je kan vroeg zeggen, ons noemt het ook die bostelevisie. Die vier is in ons, voor ons ook een bostelevisie. Zo, so, ons kijkt die televisie niet, maar ons kijkt het ook rond om die vier mm. in keer. We noemen het televisie op de природe, wanneer we zitten om de kruis en we praten met elkaar. Ja. Zo, so, wat is die gunsteling sport? En wat is jouw liefde sport? Hockey. 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 Uh, is die een sport? Ice hockey, yes. Meneer Rogotje, nou goed, ons het nou niet ijs hockey in zuid want Zuid-Afrika is te warm. Ik denk ons, ons ijs, uh, ijs, wat de meeste banen gaan smelt. Maar ons speel rugby hier zo. Heet die alle rugby wedstrijd bijgewoon? Neverne, of jaar niet tak populair in hockey, want er moest de lot rustaat. Но э, регби, в свою очередь, очень популярен. И были ли вы когда-либо на матче по регби? Да, я был, смотрел. Я болел за южноафриканскую команду, которая обыграла французскую команду. Акет регби, вестрейт, бейховоин. И там был спел между Францией и Северо-Африканской спаной. И я был за Северо-Африканской спан. И Северо-Африканской спан был гевен. Это очень хорошо. Вы даже регби в России? Играет ли в регби в России? 
В России играют в регби, но по популярности, я думаю, что этот вид спорта где-то в середине или, может быть, в конце второй двадцатки, второй десятки. Я регби ворд уэкен Руслан хаспел, мар тис не so популярный, и возможно, это один из топ-10 спорт в Руслан. Um, I, th I think, Mr. Uh, Rogachev, that's also one of the reasons why we, we need to talk more to the Afrikaner and Boer people, because we will help you uh, with rugby in Russia to become uh, one of the most popular sports. Okay, that was just a, a side note. <laughs> but no, but uh, thank you very much for this uh, idea. Uh, but it is being implemented, and we really? have quite a number of so South African players and I think uh, coaches as well in, mm -hmm. in Russia, mm. uh, who are in the, uh, well, our Premier League, of course, and, and uh, yes, so the, uh, this process is on. Absolutely. Good. But, but, but we would welcome more, more assistance in this. We'll talk about it, definitely. We need to get better. Exactly. <coughs> uh, yeah. Um, what, see, what is your Gunstelling Boere Kors of Gerech? Какая ваша любимая африканерская еда или блюдо? Ну, я мясной человек, мне очень нравится брай, вот все виды, кстати. Я как флейсман. Я не могу все эти флейсы в Африке. Это хорошо слышать. Замечательно. Приятно слышать. Ну, есть ли какие-то другие интересные традиции или габрайки в Африке, но специфично в отношении от нас, бурокультур? Wat je opvalt uh, in vergelijking met wat je in Rusland eet? Is er in de Afrikaanse, in de Zuid-Afrikaanse, in de Zuid-Afrikaanse traditie, een die van de Russische? Ik heb niet zo veel verschillende verschillen gezien. Ik heb niet zo veel verschillen gezien tussen de Russische en de Afrikaanse культур. Я думаю, что есть небольшие вещи, которые можно было бы перенять друг у друга. Ну, в частности, мы обратили внимание, что что на себя вот здесь обращает внимание, это то, что почти во всех семьях стремятся иметь как можно больше детей. Это не тот случай, который вот сейчас вот не та культура, которая у нас процветает в Российской Федерации. В России, в частности. Я думаю, что это очень правильно, и именно так и должно быть. И вот хотелось бы, чтобы вот это понимание, такой подход к созданию семьи, чтобы он возобладал и у нас тоже. Да, раз сумма традиций сов хавуны, да, да, руси саменсы кан уэк крей, before build, Afrikaners, uh, of Afrikaanse, Afrikaanse, uh, of boerenfamilies uh, krijgen meer kinderen dan Russische families. En uh, ik denk dat dit uh, iets wat recht is. En uh, dus, uh, die rechte uh, ideeën, die rechte uh, um, beleid, dat ons kan ook in, uh, in onze realiteit uh, implementeren. <coughs> Als ik een vraag wat ik nou wil graag extra voeg, bijvoeg, um, Polina, is. Ja. Ons het boerenmuziek. Um, wat is muziek het, het jylle wat traditioneel is, wat jylle weet in, in Rusland het? Uh, Dopelnitelijke vraag, wat ik wilde vragen, uh, uh, is er in Juar is traditionele Afrikaanse muziek, is er in Rusland zelfs de muziek? Да, конечно, у нас и собственно народная музыка очень развита, и свои народные инструменты, и в разных частях России это разные инструменты, и манеры исполнения, да, в том числе там и горловое пение на севере. И есть такой более современный вид, как русский романс, как да, романтичный романтик сонгс. И, конечно, очень значительная часть э, той музыки, которая считается классической музыкой, она написана, создана э, русскими композиторами. Я, Тарас, фолк-мюзик в Руслан, 
En uh, verschillende delen van Rusland hebben verschillende volkmuziek. Bijvoorbeeld die noord van Rusland um, is beroemd met uh, koor, met verschillende koren. <laughs> en uh, daar is ook uh, die Russische romans of romantieke liedjes. Um, en daar is ook die klassieke muziek. Uh, dat uh, is met, met verschillende Russische uh, schrijvers uh, geskep. We zagen een few of those cultural uh, uh, um, performances of the Russian uh, music uh, playspellen, I don't know, you know, songs. Uh, you know, and I think, you know, we, we, we really love that. I think that was very good music that we heard from the Russian music. So I would say I would want to um, translate some of those songs from Russia to Afrikaans. I think it would be it would become <laughs> good songs in South Africa, to be quite honest. Mr. Only <laughs> after office hours. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mr. Uh, Rogachev, I just want to talk to our viewers quickly. As you can know, see, as Russians and Africans, uh, it's a moeilijk thing. I think arme Polina, <coughs> het, het er erg waar, she has to mooi sit om alles te balanceren. Ik bedoel, ik sikkel so met Engels. Nou, hoe op aarde moet ons nou nog vir, vir haar van haar verwag om van Russians and Afrikaans te vertel. Maar, Ons gaan net gauw in die volgende stukje wil ons bykie praat oor ons taal, oor die Russische taal en Afrikaanse taal. <coughs> Want die feit is so dat as ons nie met mekaar kan communikeer nie, maak het, uh, maak het is vir ons moeilik om ons verskille te kan bespreek en te kan debatteer. <coughs> so, Mr. Rogachev, what we saying is we, the, the fact that we, we have differences in our languages makes it difficult for us to debate issues. So if you and I have a problem, uh, we, we rather de- decide not to take, the t- to discuss it because um, w- w- we stand away because we, we don't understand one another. I can't, I can't uh, express myself in my language. So that's why we we want to we want to take this one closer to 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 talk about language how can we how do you accommodate us with afrikaans and on our side how can we we learn russia a russian language mm. so because because of the huge barriers that stands between our cultural groups and yours so so we want to make this communication more effectively <clears throat> so one of the questions uh, before you leave, uh, we're almost there, then, then you can uh, leave, uh, uh, Polina. Is I want to ask you the, the, the number of um, letters in your alphabet. How many letters do you have in your alphabet? 33. 33? I think, yes. Yeah, 33. Now, for us, kijkers, daar kan jullie zelf zien dat het al klaar meer alphabet letters. Dit betekent dat er meer woorden kan gemaakt worden met die. Met die uh, Alphabet. <coughs> so, and, and we made it easier during the last uh, uh, centuries. So we got rid of uh, a number of letters. Is it? So you even and got it used rid to of be much more. Yes. Really, but I also see there's a three that is one of the letters, or is it just an uh, flip uh, e? What? No, it's 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 like a Z in English. Like a Z. Z. Yes. So it's a Z. What specific? Challenges or opportunities for language learning uh, between Russian and Afrikaans speakers do you see when you engage in Afrikaans people? Well, uh, yeah. there, um, I don't see any unsurmountable uh, problems uh, on this path. I mean, uh, in, in Russia there are several places when uh, one can study Afrikaans. It's uh, somewhat more difficult for the Russian language in South Africa, unfortunately. But uh, in Russia, there are uh, at least uh, three universities where one can study Afrikaans. It's uh, in the Moscow uh, State University. Uh, and within it, uh, there is an um, Institute of Asian and African Countries. It is located just an opposite to the Kremlin, by the way, like 300 meters. So uh, they usually have a, a group studying Afrikaans there. Then there is another traditional place, uh, the one that I have graduated from, as I mentioned, Moscow State Institute of International Relations. 
And um, uh, there is also um, in uh, Kazan Federal University, uh, the, 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 there are short course of Afrikaans um, uh, for students of the Institute of International Relations, History and Oriental Studies. So there are three, three places then uh, where uh, it, it has been taught. And, um, да, Полина, расскажи им, пожалуйста, как ты учила африканцев? Well, you may uh, answer in Afrikaans of in, uh, in You can do it in English, yeah. <laughs> Let's stick to English, Martin, so that at least Mr. Rogachev can understand it as well. Rogachev. Um, in, in Russia, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, there are three universities that give Afrikaans um, lessons, and uh, these uh, lessons are fully implemented in the program. So if you take the course... You study the language for four years during your bachelor studies, and then you can continue with your master studies and all in all study the language for six years, um, as I did it myself. Um, so we had classes uh, three times uh, per uh, per week in my in the university that uh, that is Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Um, it was a second language um, after English. In the other university that was mentioned also, that is a famous one, Moscow State University, uh, the students usually have classes even six times per week. So they have like a full uh, uh, understanding of the language of the country, not even uh, the country, but the whole region of Southern Africa, because the students also have introduction into the history, geography, culture, and they uh, managed to communicate with South Africans in uh, living in, in Russia, for example, from the South African embassy in Russia. Um, so I would say the students have a good um, like preparation before going to the country. And, um, and, but, the, but the professors that give uh, lessons, they are Russian. And uh, they uh, themselves even uh, managed to publish several books, uh, dictionaries, and even the book of political translation has been uh, released already. And you can study uh, even without uh, knowing English. You can study Afrikaans uh, just from the scratch. Uh, how do you, if, you, if you have to compare Russian with, with Afrikaans, how difficult would you say is it? Oh. Because for us it's very difficult, but for you, <laughs> how difficult was Personally, it? Personally, I believe that uh, Afrikaans uh, is a bit um, easier for us to study, especially if a person, um, for example, studied German or any other uh, language from this group. Um, so you can understand the structure, uh, some words also. You can uh, know them even without learning them specifically. Uh, the problem is probably the uh, oral practice and listening because we need more of that uh, to master the language. Is that why the students would come to South Africa for a period? Um, that is indeed the case. And then you get friends here and then those friends you talk Afrikaans with them and then you start WhatsApping one, one another with uh, an Afrikaans. <laughs> yeah, you can do like that. Absolutely, <laughs> but Tulina... Spasiba, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for helping us here and do the translation uh, today with this interview. Bye, thank you. Mr. Rogachev, there's just one thing that I actually picked up about the Russian language, and it says that over a quarter of the world scientific literature uh, is published in Russian. Russian is also applied um, as a means of coding and storage of universal knowledge. 60 to 70 percent of all world information is published in English and Russian languages. And, the, uh, and the, the, uh, Russian is one of the six official languages of the United Nations. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm uh, no, no, not, uh, I was not aware about the numbers that you, you have provided, but it is one of the six uh, official languages, yes. and. Many people outside Russia use it, uh, especially in the former Soviet Union, of course, in the former Soviet republics, uh, now independent states. 
uh, and beyond, actually, as uh, many people study the Russian and uh, studied in Russia. Uh, and and uh, there are a lot of uh, scientific exchanges uh, and, and areas where uh, Soviet uh, scientists and Russian scientists are uh, in the, the first ranks. Uh, and so uh, the literature, other others are interested in having uh, literature in original language uh, from, from Russian. You talked about regional languages. I see here it says there's about 190 something ethnic groups and then there are some hundred languages. Yes. Uh, so how does the languages differ between the, or the Russian language be, uh, differ between those, uh, I read about 85 um, uh, federal subjects. How do they, how do they differ in, in, throughout Russia? Uh, well, in terms, of, in terms of dialect and accents. Well, it's not just dialects and accents. It's uh, completely different uh, languages, and uh, there are places in uh, Russia, like in the Caucasus and the Dag in Dagestan, for example, or in the Far East, where uh, very small ethnos, uh, like comprising just several hundred people, uh, speak a, a language that their neighbors do not understand even. Uh, there are historical uh, reasons for that, in particular in the Caucasus, but uh, people in one village do not understand the language of uh, people in, in the neighboring village. This may often be the case. Uh, and uh, the languages are, are pretty different. They belong to, to different families um, uh, of languages. Uh, they, they, are, they, they are quite different. So it, it's not easy, but... Um, uh, we are used to, to, to live like that because we've always lived like that. Mm -hmm. So we somehow we manage. But you do respect all the people with the different languages, with the different, different cultures in your... Oh, yes, yes, the, yes of course. Uh, and and uh, it, it, it is very important from uh, different points of view, including from a purely scientific point of view. And there, is, uh, there are programs, state-run state programs, of preserving uh, heritages, and uh, including languages of uh, the uh, small ethnos. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in the last century, a uh, few languages, uh, it's not that they disappear, I wanted to say that, but mm -hmm. they are not spoken anymore. Mm -hmm. So we need to preserve uh, at least the written, uh, if the, there is a written language, we, we need to, to, to preserve this. And there are uh, people and there are resources that are allocated uh, to, to this goal. And um, uh, as I said, this is a state policy. <clears throat> um, one of the Afrikaans uh, people that I spoke to is, is actually a radio commentator. Uh, he explained it the other day very um, interesting to me. He said that language is like uh, a, a bowl of water. So the water is your language. So um, the the... the the more you speak your language, the more the water becomes, and the more you, the more freedom you have to express and to be yourself, and uh, and that that um, analogy stayed with me, stayed to say that whenever people try to oppress one's language, you are actually taking out the water, and you you actually let that fish or that person die in who he really is. Um, but that was just a side note from, from the side. Mm -hmm. The last question on, on language is, um, I've tried to find some, some Afrikaans institutions on the internet uh, that would allow us to learn um, in class uh, Russian here in South Africa. Are you aware of any institutions in South Africa or are they only online? Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I'm not aware, and uh, there are none mm. of uh, institutions that would uh, teach Russian in class, and uh, it's only available on uh, online. So, um, but uh, we are in partnership, in working partnership with the Saint Petersburg University uh, and some other institutions in Russia, and. Uh, uh, um, we uh, try to, to have um, as many 
online courses as possible. And uh, we, with great satisfaction, uh, note that there is a demand for, for studying Russian. Uh, right now, there are about 1,500 uh, students who are uh, learning Russian online. And um, uh, there will be more, certainly. And the, 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 we accept uh, uh, applications twice per year. And the next intake will be uh, in September 2024, this coming September. So, who is interested? There is an opportunity, there is a possibility to do that. Okay. But we're working on, on of course, on having it, uh, in, uh, having Russian language uh, taught in class. Uh, we were hopeful. I have to say, I found uh, several guys <clears throat> that I didn't realize, uh, you know, uh, on some of the groups that we are and people that are speaking to us that have actually indicated that they're busy with something like that they are on an online mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll definitely uh, have a look at that. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Rogachev, now the more interesting part is we want to talk about um, a little bit of history and culture. Uh, we... We are sitting here, and I want to talk about the history and culture so that we can help our viewers understand both sides a little bit better. So sometimes we have to go back in the past to learn from our mistakes, and that is, this is why I love history. History is uh, something that you cannot change, but you can always learn from it. I think that we, we are all, um, unfortunately, in that position. We, can, we can't do much about the history. We can only learn from it. Um, and then I also want to um, quote uh, one of our old presidents, of President Paul Kruger. He said, take, from, t t take out of the past what is good and uh, bolt on it for the future. So that was my translation. Uh, so the Afrikaans people, uh, if I translated it wrong, just put it in the comments there of the video and say if I was wrong or, or not, but you're welcome. Um, so, how <clears throat> uh, history um, from the from our uh, Boer and Afrikaner people started basically in 1652. Now, I just wanted to give this little bit of a background to our viewers. So, we basically started in 1652, while the Russia's history started in the 9th century after Christ, um, in the medieval period. So, basically. We are around for only 370 years, um, while Russia is around for 1,100 years. So <clears throat> that's what, why we're going now with my next question. So I don't want you to take us back all the way to the 9th century, but just give us a brief history or background, uh, if you can, of the, especially the last 200 years, but with also specifically to understand, to, to make people understand how the, the Russian system worked? I mean, you had Tsardom, you did not, or, or, you know, is it similar to a monarchy? People don't understand that. They, they want to know. And so say they ask questions, were Russia also an imperial country? And, you know, uh, do they have, did they have royals? Mm. You know, um, I would like, if you allow me, to, to go back a little bit to the beginning of your introduction to this part, uh, when you said that uh, history cannot be changed. Yes, it cannot be changed, but it can be rewritten. And uh, this is something uh, that we're witnessing now. In, uh, the process is in full bloom as uh, there are different attempts, uh, in particular, to smear Russia's history, Russian state, Russian people, to rewrite history in many aspects, in particular making uh, USSR uh, equally responsible with uh, Nazi Germany for the beginning of the Second World War and making Stalin, equ equating it, uh, him to uh, Hitler in terms of responsibility for the uh, beginning of the Second World War and so on. And, uh, of course, you can uh, hear that allies, meaning Americans and the Brits and the French, who won the Second World War, uh, while 80% of Wehrmacht 
fought on the Eastern Front, that is against us, against the USSR, as Russia is a continuing state, the continuing state, perhaps, I should say. And 85 of the losses that Wehrmacht suffered in the Second World War, uh, it suffered uh, on the Eastern Front. So, um, well, the turning point of the Second World War, as you can hear, wasn't the Battle of Midway, but it was the Battle of Kursk, of Stalingrad, and, and other battles that were fought uh, in, in, uh, on the Eastern Front by the Germans. So, uh, this is just an example of how it can be not changed, but rewritten, but uh, for many people who do not know uh, the, the real course of events, who are not aware of it, 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 it can be changed, yes, and uh, the, then uh, you, you just can, uh, you know, extrapolate uh, why it is being done on, the, you know, on modern times, and you, you will clearly see political reasons for doing that. But um, now to, to, to Russian history. Yeah. I yeah. will not go back to the 9th century. Um, if somebody is interested, recently there was an absolutely breathtaking interview by our president, Mr. Putin, to Tucker Carlson. And the first half hour it was dedicated exactly to the history. Uh, and uh, that, that, of course, that wasn't just, you know, uh, by chance. But the uh, president did it uh, uh, in a premeditated manner to, to allow listeners, the audience, to better understand uh, all the complexity and uh, uh, historical uh, background of our relationship with modern Ukraine and Ukrainians. Um, but uh, for us, uh, what is important, and well, you, you actually mm. ask mm. about mm. Uh, the Tsardom uh, of Russia and the Russian Empire, and how did it, uh, how did the system work? Well, uh, uh, Russia began uh, in uh, several uh, feudal uh, principalities, and uh, I think the fourth capital of. Uh, of, uh, was was already a Moscow princip Moscow Moscow principality that uh, gained strength in uh, 15th early 15th century uh, and then uh, it acquired it uh, subordinated uh, other principalities and then acquired uh, more territories uh, and and eventually uh, became an empire. Empire, well, there is a date for this event. Mm -hmm. It is 1721, when Peter the Great, uh, at that time known as Tsar Peter the I, uh, became, proclaimed himself emperor, responding to the appeal by members of Russia's Senate. And uh, that the Senate uh, proceeded from the uh, fact that Russia uh, won a very important uh, war in its history that lasted from 1700 to 1721. Uh, we call it the Northern War, and that was against Sweden. And in the late 16th, 17th uh, century, Sweden, uh, imagine it, uh, was the strongest, the biggest, the most aggressive uh, state in Europe. It's not the Sweden that we know now. Mm, mm. Um, but, um, uh, and it's uh, uh, Emperor Karl uh, XII was one of the most successful military leaders of his time. Perhaps the most successful, at least in, in Europe. So that war cost us a lot uh, and it meant a lot to, to the um, Russian society. And uh, when we have won it, mm -hmm. uh, we reacquired uh, Russian, historically Russian lands on the Baltic Sea. And we, so we gained access to the Baltic Sea. That was important for developing trade in particular. Um, and uh, mm, uh, so Peter, Peter the Great proclaimed himself emperor of all, the, of all Russia. And uh, the, the, that was... Basically, it was a formality in many ways. 
uh, it d- didn't change really the way the country was governed. Mm-hmm. And uh, Russians uh, continued to call uh, their ruler Tsar. So both names were used, both both titles so, were so Tsar or or so Tsar or the, the emperor or, or the Tsar. Yes, emperor. Yeah, I'm with you. Emperor or Tsar. Nice. Uh, so so the, the, that that was this this event, this war that that led to to to, to, to proclaiming empire. Uh, empire. Uh, but um, in fact, the unification of Russian principalities, Russian lands, of Russians, uh, or uh, I think that we cannot already use uh, the term Eastern Slavic tribes. The, the, they were Russians by that time. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it began uh, two, two centuries prior to that. Uh, um, the, the Tsar, um, Moscow Tsar, uh, Ivan IV, when he uh, defeated the Khanate of Kazan, and then uh, it, it was followed by uh, Siberia's uh, unification with Russia. Um, and then there is, uh, I would like to mention yet another uh, war and another battle, uh, and that was against uh, the uh, Golden Horde, the Mongolo- Mongol and Tatar um, entity, uh, after they have uh, uh, subordinated uh, separate Russian principalities, most of them actually. And uh, for more than 200 years, most of uh, Russians lived under the yoke of Mongol Tatars. But it was 1380 when um, Russians um, defeated uh, Mongol Tatars uh, uh, in a battle on the so-called on the so-called Kulikovo Pole. That that was a very significant moment again in our history. Mm. Mm. Uh, when when, uh, people from different principalities united and uh, one of the prominent Russian historians wrote that uh, people from uh, different principalities came to that field, uh, stood there, fought there, and they were from Moscow, from Rostov, and from different cities, Vladimir, Tver, and, and others. Uh, so they came came there like that, and, and but they went back as Russians already. So that that was a very prominent moment in our history, and, and when one uh, mm-hmm. nation, Russian nation, uh, basically was formed. And, and I mean, if if somebody needs a, a formal uh, date, this is it for, for that for that moment. Um, and you say the formal date, fourteen. Uh, 1380. 1380. Yeah. Okay. So, so that that could be your. That's what you said. That was the catalyst that for, formulated the, yes. the Russian nation, or the, yes. the the start of the Russian, yeah, nation. Yeah, it, it was like a capped already the process. Okay. Yes, I'm with you. Mm-hmm. But 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 then after that, you know, the the different cultures find themselves within the the what you call it. The geopolitical movement in in, mm-hmm. in there, um, so so of course there were different cultures in there. But did Russia also then try to expand through conquest and colonization to the western side? Um, well, the, there is now nowadays there is a con, um, negative connotation yeah, to, I know. to the word I, empire. I, I, yes. I wanted to correct myself. Yeah, yeah um, back then with the, the glasses that we use mm-hmm, back then. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, um, uh, of course, uh, again, uh, there is this uh, anti-Russian interpretation of history, uh, saying that Russia colonized so, so, so much uh, mm. land, uh, lands and peoples. Uh, no, no, it, it was different. Uh, and um, um, the reasons uh, uh, that uh, led uh, the circumstances that led to the uh, establishing of the Russian state and Russian empire in uh, these uh, borders, uh, like a tremendous mass land, land mass. Yeah. 
Sorry. Um, they, they were particular um, and, and, and special. You see, uh, I started talking about uh, our uh, war uh, with, this, with the Swedes, but uh, yes, Swedes attacked and took away some lands uh, on the shore of Baltic Sea uh, previously. And then we had uh, to return that uh, to, to get them back. Uh, in this uh, northern war. Uh, but there was also uh, another uh, very strong and uh, dangerous uh, neighbor uh, of ours uh, to the west, which was a Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the 16th century, early 17th century. And they attacked also uh, Russian principalities. Uh, divided at that time, and uh, um, we also had this uh, very difficult period in our history when uh, uh, Russian state was on the brink and could disappear at the so-called troubled times. Troubled uh, times. Yeah, when, when was the, trou the troubled times? It was uh, end of the 16th century and up to 1612. Um, Everything ended by the end of the year 1612, and uh, uh, Romanov uh, dynasty uh, began with uh, in 1613, and they ruled for more than 300 years in Russia. And uh, the election of Tsar, of the, the first Tsar of Romanov dynasty in 1613, uh, basically put the end to the troubled times. <clears throat> Is that when Michael the First? Hmm? Yeah. Uh, Michael the First. Yeah. Yes. And and um, uh, it was people's militia, basically, not the military, that were dispersed, uh, that um, chased away Polish-Lithuanian interventions, interventionists. Uh, uh, and and uh, the Polish uh, henchmen uh, uh, sit uh, in Kremlin for um, more than two years, actually. So uh, again, the Russian state was was uh, in a very precarious situation, and uh, uh, people united, uh, and and it's, it was people militia who fought this this war and and uh, became victorious in it. Mm. So can we say it's, it's people who take charge of their own destiny? Who, exactly. Who, who, who took yes. basically over yes. there. Yes, uh, that's that, that what I wanted to say. But uh, that, that was our uh, very dangerous uh, neighbor uh, on, the, in, uh, on the western side, uh, who coveted uh, permanently uh, some Russian lands and, and, and uh, even uh, dreamed of uh, having uh, their king, Polish king, in, in Moscow, in Kremlin. Yeah. But in the south, there was also some, some danger. Uh, in particular, we uh, border, th th there was no border, because between us there were no, no, no one's, no man's land. But in uh, Crimea, there were remnants of um, one of the branches of Mongolo-Tatar invasion, People stayed there, the, uh, the Crimean Tatars, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, accepted Islam and uh, were dependent uh, upon Ottoman Empire. They pay, paid tri tribute to the Ottoman Empire and uh, they were directed in many cases uh, by the Ottomans. And uh, one of the uh, uh, you know, places to pray for them were southern Russian uh, principalities. And um, so they, they suffered a lot. I see. And in particular, uh, uh, Crimean Tatars uh, used to simply catch people and, and uh, then sell them on the slave markets in Istanbul or through, through Ottomans to, to Western Europe. 
Um, so that was the danger in, in the south. Uh, in the east, though, uh, it was, uh, the situation was quite different because uh, these enormous lands were very sparsely populated and uh, peoples uh, living there uh, were uh, subjugated, uh, had been subjugated prior to that by the Golden Horde and they wanted to get rid of uh, the Mongolian rule at that time. So, uh, Siberia, which uh, you can read in Western uh, historical textbooks, uh, was annexed and colonized and so on. It, it was basically liberated because the whole Siberia was... Uh, uh, the, the Kazakhs went there with the detachment of just about 800 people. <coughs> who, who were the Kazakhs? We okay. will get there. Um, uh, so that was not uh, the state-run company, that was not state politics, but uh, the Kazakhs, the, the, the free men basically, went there on their own and they conquered uh, with uh, 800 men and, and two or three cannons the whole of Siberia because people uh, gladly, in, in many cases, well they had some battles, but on many cases, uh, people gladly accepted uh, the, um, you know, uh, protection that was guaranteed mm -hmm. by uh, the Moscow, uh, by, by Tsars, or by mm -hmm. Russian uh, Tsars from Moscow. So, um, that was not a colonization like in Africa, for example, by mm -hmm. the Europeans. And then, of course, there are... Uh, uh, the, these reasons, these political or perhaps even military reasons. So I, I told you that uh, in the north, in the west and in the south, uh, Russians had uh, pretty strong and aggressive uh, entities uh, uh, who coveted Russian lands, uh, in particular forests, resources that had come from the forests. Uh, viewers, yeah, etc. Yeah. I, I saw in the ways there's always commotion going on there on the western side. They were, you know, yeah, it was kind of always this way and then that Absolutely. way. They, they, Absolutely. Pushed, they pushed on that yeah. on the western side. Yeah, well, if you go even further back in history, uh, then uh, uh, you can you could see that uh, Slavic tribes used to live much more uh, to the west and to the south than uh, they were. In, in, in the Middle Ages, but they were squeezed out by uh, Germanic tribes uh, and, and so they had to go east. And then in the lands that are uh, adjacent to the Black Sea, to Aral Sea, to the Caspian Sea, that was basically the corridor which was used for the uh, many, many peoples, nomads from the east to move to the west. Uh, like uh, during this period of the great migration of peoples. So mm -hmm. the Slavs had to move to the north. This is how uh, we uh, got uh, mixed with the uh, Finnish Ugorian uh, tribes. I'm with you. Uh, <clears throat> but th that's, that's very far in history. Yeah. Uh, so um, at that time, as I said, uh, on the three sides we had uh, pretty aggressive neighbors and um, psychology, uh, psychologically, uh, it was necessary for uh, the Russians to, you know, to move, uh, the, to, to, to expand, you know, uh, the, the, the lands under their control. So they, they moved um, to the north, to the east and to the south to reach the natural borders. Uh, it was impossible already in, in, in the West, but, uh, but in, in three other direction, directions it was possible. Mm. And the idea was to protect uh, uh, the hardcore Russia, the principalities that were in the European part, uh, what we now call European part uh, of Russia, and um, uh, to protect its people and to protect faith. That was very important. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, 
many parties, uh, geographical parties, went to the north and then to the east and then to the south, and there were few wars fought in the south and on all sides. Uh, and um, you know, that, that was uh, basically how empire appeared, because uh, we needed to establish mm -hmm. Uh, certain control over the lands in order to prevent further aggressions, which we didn't manage. <clears throat> but I, I, I have to uh, say, I, I see you, you did not only have male rulers um, in your list of uh, emperors or tsars. Uh, I see Elizabeth, I see Anna, I see a Catherine. I see Catherine was after Peter the Great. So she did some some. Uh, no, 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 no. When do they when uh, do they get the the the, the term the great? Uh, well, uh, actually, Catherine uh, the second. She was Catherine the second. Yeah. Prior to her was Catherine the first. Um, um, uh, she she actually contributed a lot to the development of, of the Russian state, Russian culture, Russian science, and this is why uh, she. Uh, she was uh, nicknamed Catherine the Great, uh, but she, she she is not Russian ethnically. Uh, she, she, she's princess from uh, Schleswig Holstein, in in Germany. So basically, from from Germany. Yes. Okay. Uh, she 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 was uh, brought to to, to marry uh, a crown prince, and uh, so uh, uh, she she after. Uh, chain of events, she became uh, Empress, Empress of Russia. Uh, but she uh, made an absolutely uh, uncomparable contribution uh, to the advancement of uh, everything that is positive in Russia. And um, um, and th this is why she, uh, I yeah. think she, she deserved this, uh, this the, title. The, the, uh, that title. But, but very interesting for me to to see if I just go back to about the 1600s and I look at, at the, the list, I see there's about seven of, of these uh, rulers, let's, put, let's call it rulers, emperors or tsars, that were deposed or assassinated. Um, that's very interesting. You know, just uh, it shows you that it was kind of like a, a tough battle uh, to, to 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 stay on on the let's call it throne. Then, uh, well, yes, that was absolutely in line uh, with the mercies and absolutely. traditions uh, of, yes. of of uh, of in particular of Europe. I'm not talking about. Yeah, and other parts I, of the world, but I, I think we, it's, it's and like I, I everywhere. Did, yeah. Yes, I did not check the other countries. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I saw uh, a lot of that as well on that yes, side. Yes, yes, it, it was the same. In Russia. Yeah, yeah. So, so kind a lot of, of infighting. Yes. A lot of uh, infighting, not only between uh, the you know, rulers of uh, or princes of uh, different uh, principalities, because many of them were brothers, siblings, or. Uh, now uh, let's get cousins to, and so on. Let's get to that story. Uh, <laughs> let's get to that story. Because but but uh, yes, uh, well, also in fighting uh, like real uh, full-scaled wars between principalities as well. Now that story you told us uh, in, in one of the meetings before, and I want you to t to tell us uh, our viewers again about that one. About I think it's Wilhelm the second from Germany. He was the counselor. Am I right of of Germany? Nicholas the Chancellor, yes. Chancellor, and then, then Nicholas the Second was uh, the, the Tsar from Russia, and then George the Fifth was the King of Britain. Mm -hmm. Now there was a period from 1917 till 19, uh, 1910 till 1917, where all three of them were kind of they were ruling uh, their countries. Just tell us about that that the three those three cousins. What do you know about them and? Uh, w w w Anything else about their history? Well, uh, I, I do not know a lot, uh, actually, uh, especially uh, I cannot uh, tell you, like bring, bringing in the third cousin, the Wilhelm, uh, but uh, uh, there is um, a very telling history of relationship between Nicholas II and George uh, the, the, V. And, um, and they kind of look alike if you if you look at them. Absolutely. Uh, if if you type in uh, this uh, a photo of, of 
these two uh, in uh, at least in Russian uh, segment of internet, you will immediately have this picture or several of them when uh, they are together and uh, they look like siblings, not if not twins, not like cousins. And, uh, sometimes it's only the outfit. You can d d d distinguish them only by the, mm -hmm. the outfit. Uh, so, um, the, the, there is a projection of, uh, well, I mean, uh, that, that it's, it's not only physical closeness, uh, say similarity, but they, they, they were relatively close, I think, uh, in, 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 in their personal relationship. And um, uh, it has uh, um, a projection on uh, our history of relationship between the Russians and the Boers. Because when Paul Kruger asked Nicholas II to interfere and to protect uh, the Boer states from uh, the British uh, colonizers, uh, it, it was this uh, really, uh, relationship that, that prevented Nicholas II, the family ties that prevented him from entering this war, though uh, all Russian society Including so, political so, class so, was so, sympathetic with the Boers. So is that the reason? That's the reason. <clears throat> but the yes. other, the other side. As far I, as I know. No, I hear what you say, and I think the other side was also. That's why Paul Kruger, Kruger spoke to Nicholas II because hey, talk to your cousin mm -hmm. <laughs> and see, you know, something about mm -hmm. that. That's just uh, speculation from my side. But um, that that was interesting because. If, if their relation was a uh, relationship was so so good, uh, I read somewhere that in 1917, when when Nicholas the Second abdicated, uh, George the Fifth did not want to uh, give him protection in in Britain. Well, uh, Nicholas the uh, Second behaved uh, in the Russian way, how he uh, thought it was appropriate. So he refused to enter the war with uh, uh, the British Empire formally, but uh, he uh, said uh, to the court, and that was that, that that trickled down, that he wouldn't oppose uh, volunteers going uh, to assist uh, the Boers, and uh, okay. uh, that that, uh, <clears throat> that that was used by many, and and so. Well, this is a separate uh, issue. So, so uh, Russia did not send officially uh, soldiers here, but the volunteers could yes, come? Yeah, okay. Yes, the volunteers and then uh, the emperor, he funded uh, from his own money uh, the uh, uh, Red Cross uh, uh, team that came here and stayed in Newcastle in particular. And then 50-50 uh, they, they funded with the King of the Netherlands another uh, Red Cross uh, hospital that also was deployed on the Boer side, and, mm -hmm. but actually helped uh, all the victims uh, in total, of that war. In total, how many, how many of, uh, Russian volunteers were here to help in the Anglo-Boer War, the second one? We do not know exactly, uh, but uh, certainly more than 220, 230, more mm -hmm. than that, uh, up to 270. This is what uh, the latest uh, researchers say. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but if you look at those uh, uh, medical groups or medical people that helped, I think it could yeah, have been it, even it's, more. It's more, yes. Yeah. It's more, yeah. We, we, it's just, we count people who fought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah the, the, yes. The guys that uh, entered. Mm. So, so, so the, the, that was the the behavior uh, and the line and the policy of, on the Russian side in this. Uh, and then you are absolutely right. Uh, George the the fifth behaved in a appropriate manner uh, in his own way. And uh, when uh, the emperor's family uh, was uh, in danger. Uh, they did not provide uh, the George V, uh, the, the Brits did not provide them with shelter, and so they ended up being uh, shot. Or, as they say, executed. Is executed, that, yes. Is that the problem? <clears throat> but the, it is, this is a, actually a very sad story with the fact that um, the, the emperor and his whole uh, uh, family got uh, executed. Am I right? Yes, most probably. There are the different, you know, uh, rumors uh, 
Is it? Uh, about that, but uh, who was shot, uh, executed, where, when, and uh, if somebody survived. But uh, no, there was official version <clears throat> that is corroborated by, by uh, extensive research saying that uh, they all, unfortunately, uh, were died, died at that time, mm. at that place in Ekaterinburg. And, 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 the, and the fingers point to Leon Trotsky. Well, again, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a debatable who gave the okay. exact order and how it was interpreted and implemented. Again, there are many, many details. Before I, I talk about the Russian volunteers a little bit in depth, I just want to ask you um, something that we all have to hear and we all unfortunately have to talk through and understand is Russia also had slavery and people don't understand that uh, completely. We all think that when we're born, we're born into a perfect world, but we have to look back at the past again and see that Russia also had sa slavery and it was called serfdom and it is it prevailed for a few centuries, I think what, two or three centuries. What is serfdom? And uh, one thing that our viewers won't understand that right now, and I did not, um, is I don't know what is a serf and I don't know what is a peasant. Okay, we know what is a peasant uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the, 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 the uh, academic uh, definition thereof. But <clears throat> what is a peasant and what is a serf? Uh, yeah. And, and serve them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I want to, 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 you know, to complement uh, my answer to the previous question a little bit uh, by stating that um, why Russian Empire, uh, in what ways it was different from a traditional empire, uh, like in Western European um, colonial empires in particular. Um, as well, the, there are several features to that, and that will help us to 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 get to the uh, your actual question about uh, serfdom. Uh, empire, Russian Empire, never gave any privileges to the core nation, to the Russians itself, and it never exploited uh, the outskirts. Uh, and the peoples living in, uh, outside of this uh, historically Russian um, uh, lands. Uh, on, on the contrary, uh, Russian Empire, just as uh, USSR did actually, invested a, a lot in the development of uh, its uh, margins. And uh, there was no inhumane treatment of indigenous uh, population, as it um, uh, often was the case um, in, in, uh, with the European colonization, in particular in North America, and uh, here in Africa, elsewhere. Um, so, um, Russia uh, uh, properly uh, got uh, very little in return from, from this. So that gave uh, reasons uh, to historians to call it that the, the um, actually foundations for the Russian Empire were not economic, but uh, it was somewhere in political and military and security area rather than anywhere else. And uh, uh, other peoples um, enjoyed a protection by Moscow, by the mighty Russian army. And um, in particular, like uh, Georgia joined uh, Russia, they asked uh, several times for the protectorate uh, from Moscow. They do not like to remember it now, but it, it is the historical fact, because Georgia, uh, being a Christian country, was menaced uh, by Ottoman Empire on the one side and by uh, the uh, Persian Empire on the other side. Uh, so that was the reason for um, uh, so to conclude a certain treaty that, that, that made Georgia part of uh, the Russian Empire. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so um, these uh, these vast lands that were acquired with time um, 
the, as I said, they were very sparsely populated, mostly. And um, the movement of uh, people was, was very extensive in the Russian Empire. So economic reason, uh, the economic need was uh, to make uh, peasants stay on the land where they were working on. And, but they uh, were connected to the land. Uh, they, they were not, so no. they, they could move. Okay. Uh, they could move uh, to the south, to southeast, uh, <clears throat> east, <clears throat> and so on. And um, uh, um, this is how Kazakhs appeared. Because with time, uh, the crown to which formerly all the lands belonged, um, gave it, rewarded with the lands, its gentry, and uh, the gentry uh, became uh, uh, they, they needed the workforce to work mm, for them on course. their on their <coughs> newly acquired lands, and uh, the problem was to make uh, peasants stay there. So uh, it was um, in 1497, uh, the, the, there was a uh, uh, Tsar's uh, ordinance uh, to, for the people to stay on their land. And they were allowed uh, to uh, change their place of living uh, only for a two week period during the year. So at least one agricultural season, they had to stay on the land where they were and uh, uh, to work on it. And they had to work for the uh, gentry and one tenth of, of the crops they would have to uh, give to the church. And um, uh, with time, uh, the landowners uh, compelled them, made them work more and more and more uh, and, and pay more and then to the one-tenth uh, for the church remained. And uh, so uh, peasants uh, tried to change a landowner or uh, the uh, most uh, you know, entrepreneurial of them, more adventurous of them, would travel to the outskirts of the empire where there was no man's land and, and uh, they would settle there, and this is how uh, different uh, Kazakh areas appeared, and they got organized in, in uh, the armies, in, in, uh, you know, as, as the military. They received uh, the Freedom Charter from the Crown, uh, which said basically that they are free people, uh, with only uh, one obligation, that in time of war, all of the male population would come to serve uh, as horse with their horses, with their uh, arms, uh, to, to as, as, as cavalry to, to the imperial army. So, so, <clears throat> so the peasants kind of had an agreement with the with the army. So they must they must join the army in the war. In any, in uh, it's, any... it's the Kazakhs. The Kazakhs. the Kazakhs, the free people, the free people. and and uh, the peasants uh, protested, of course, against this uh, personal depend. It is a form of personal dependency. It is not slavery per se, as uh, you know, we know it from the ancient Rome, ancient Greece. Uh, but it is, uh, of course, uh, a personal uh, let's dependency. Call, let's call it limited rights. Well, it's it's uh, yes, uh, it, it it's more uh, like uh, uh, servage in France or villainship in England. Uh, and uh, the conditions actually got worse and worse uh, for, for the peasants, of course. Uh, and finally, there was just one day left when they could uh, change the landowner. And finally, uh, after all, it, the, this day was also uh, uh, prohibited, it, it uh, canceled. Uh, so they had to stay where they were and uh, they were tied uh, to the land. If the land was sold, so de facto they were they. Mm -hmm. 
so but, but that, that, that was a, a yes. period a period of time it happens uh, it, the, uh, the this uh, serfdom was was uh, cancelled uh, in 1861 um, uh, after um, it became very clear that uh, this kind of uh, economic relationship mm. is uh, outdated it became uh, a like a break mm -hmm. on the economic development of Russia. It, is, um, it does not answer the necessities of the economic development of, of industrialization, first of all, of uh, Russian Empire already at that time. And uh, the event uh, that uh, showed that uh, very graphically was the Crimean War uh, of uh, 1853 to 1856. Uh, that Russian Empire fought against uh, Ottomans, Ottoman Empire, uh, France, British Empire, mm -hmm. and the Kingdom of Sardinia. And uh, the war was lost, one of the few wars that we, we have lost. Uh, and um, uh, the lessons drawn uh, were uh, quite severe, just, just as the defeat now that uh, the arms in the Russian army were obsolete, outdated, uh, uh, so, so was materially, the yes, was yes, the military. And, and the economic, yes, because uh, um, there was no or very slow industrial development that was um, uh, slowed down by uh, the um, lack of uh, workforce because peasants could not move to the cities. There were no, uh, they, they could not become working class because they had to stay on the land. So uh, th that was a uh, major impediment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alexander II, known as the reformer in our history, uh, in 1861, as I said, uh, abolished uh, this serfdom at all. And uh, since then, uh, the era of very rapid industrial uh, growth in Russia has be begun mm -hmm. uh, since uh, 1860s. Mm. But, but the, 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 the serfs and the peasants after that period, uh, could they then get private ownership on their own property? Well, they had their own property as well. Okay. Yes. There were uh, communal lands that they would divide among them, our, themselves, and there were uh, lands of landowner where they had to work in, in the interest of the landowner. And uh, so, but uh, the communal lands were there always. So, so <clears throat> Russia was always a strong agrarian, you know, agricultural group of people. They know knew how to uh, farm. Yes, yes, uh, because of the landmass. Uh, it, it was predominantly agricultural, uh, but in the second half, or maybe even uh, last year of the 19th century, uh, uh, a period of very rapid economic growth, industrializations started. And um, this is when Russia, uh, very developed uh, by that time, uh, standards uh, country with uh, uh, fast-growing economy and fast-growing population, actually. And uh, if you project the tendencies of growth, uh, the, the two that I've mentioned, uh, to the future, then by uh, the mid-20th century, we would have been a country with 500 million people and uh, uh, absolutely undisputedly number one economically. But then we had three revolutions. First, I World War, <clears throat> I saw that, Civil uh, War, Second World War, and so on. And the Civil War is one that I kind of like, you know, it takes from inside, eh? Yes. It takes one out from inside, so it stops your, your inside things. Oh. 
Mr. <clears throat> Rogachev, we running out of time here, and I have so much to still to to, to ask you. But there's some. I'm I'm basically just going to jump here to a few topics. I just want to say to our viewers, we will not finish the complete interview. I will see if I can get another interview at a later stage um, with Mr. Rogachev. We want to talk about agriculture. Uh, we won't be able. There's some other topics we just wanted to, t- to touch on. M- Mr. Rogachev, I. We all are familiar with the fact that you have a president, which is Mr. Vladimir Putin, but we all, you also have a prime minister. Yes. Um, so w- how does that political uh, political structure work? Is it like, you know, just give us more mm-hmm. lesson, uh, a quick mm-hmm. lesson on that? Mm-hmm. Well, um, our system, um, well, uh, the prime minister is head of the executive. Oh, okay. President is somewhere uh, has more powers than uh, just the head of the executive. Uh, it is like a, some kind of a mixture of uh, French and uh, American systems. So it's not, uh, but in between, it's it's not the French uh, case of uh, president arbiter of the nation, uh, but. Uh, he is more than just head of the uh, executive branch. Of the executive branch. <clears throat> uh, uh, a difficult question that I want to put to you, you're welcome to answer it or not, is the reason why I'm asking you these people that are um, uh, uh, blaming Mr. Putin that he's a dictator, you know, does that uh, system allow him to be a dictator or, or not? No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, it's uh, for Russians. It's it's clear. I mean, it's like uh, you know, it's uh, the continuation of the trend to call Lenin dictator, Stalin dictator, and uh, all uh, Russian Soviet uh, states dictatorships, and, and so on and so forth. Now it's uh, sm- part of the smearing campaign. He is actually much more democratic than main Western rulers. If you, if you can just explain to our viewers um, that the USSR um, demolished in 1991 and after that you, you guys became also more democrat- democratic or how does that work? If uh-huh. I say democratic, that's mm-hmm. what I, I, I picked yes, up in the research. It depends upon what, what do you mean by democracy because for many Russians it's a four-letter word now. And, and many other parts of the world as well. World as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, in '91, four-letter four word is it Russian four-letter or? Uh, uh, well, it's for English-speaking English expression. You know. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, democracy is just one of the uh, formats, one of the forms of uh, mm-hmm. self-organization of uh, a society. Mm-hmm. Who said that it's necessarily the best one no, for sure. everyone? May not be. Uh, so um, uh, the in 1991 uh, the USSR broke up, and uh, um, how it was done it's a separate story. It's a very long uh, um, and very interesting legal case uh, but um, uh, so we got rid of this we got rid of the communist ideology we got rid of uh, communist system and um, uh, that was the major uh, change politically from uh, what used to be in the USSR um, I, I, I just want to see the two parallels that happened uh, with the National Party back then when we were uh, moving over to, or, or the transformation started happening, happening back then. Uh, the Afrikaner people also, uh, in 1994, had the Afrikaner Accord. I see you guys had the Bela Vetsa Accord uh, that was part of the Ukraine and the Belarus, um, you know, when the demolishing happened. So <clears throat> we also had this accord in the accord, but basically said that we will not uh, take, uh, you know, violent or revolt. 
against the democratic revolution, uh, democratic election that's going to take place. So <clears throat> back then, the, w w that was signed uh, with the Afrikaner uh, group of people and the National Party and the NC. However, the the only outcome of, of that agreement was uh, Article 235, the right to self-determination. And that's why we are still... Uh, you know, we're still looking at self-determination as a as a minor group. When we go back to the the fact that we uh, talk about our culture and we talk about the the the, the volunteers, because that was the main uh, uh, subject for our our uh, interview, is I want to find out. Or first of all, we <clears throat> you you had in uh, your uh, time you said your your uh, starting point was. Or oh, where you can basically say you 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 became a nation. So so I think we also had those dates in our uh, history as a, as a cultural group, you know, Boers and Afrikaners, and the, <clears throat> we had the Blood River, um, the Battle of Blood River. We had the first Mayuba uh, Battle of, of Mayuba, and then of course the Second Bo uh, Boer War. But one or two that I want to. Highlight here is that in 1877, uh, the, the British uh, marched up to Pretoria and they basically annexed um, Pretoria with about, I think, 25 men or so. And, the, and the, the Boers at that time just looked at them and said, are you serious? I mean, I think Pretoria was only a few buildings. I don't think Pretoria was as big as it is now. But the, the bottom line, are you serious? And they pulled up the flag there. And it took the Boers three years to work it out that, no, Brit uh, Britain, you are not uh, serious about this. So they tried, and within that three years period, they took the boat back to the Queen, or I think it was Queen Victoria still, and <clears throat> took the boat there and tried to negotiate themselves back the, the republics, the, the Transvaal Republic. But that one also um, uh, ended up in 1880, where the Boers, where, where they started to tax, to tax the, the Boers, and then they, the Boers said, no, we're not going to take these, these tax laws and things like that. And they um, came together at Krugersdorp, and they uh, were six to eight thousand of them decided, no, we're not, go we're going to stand up against, uh, uh, so uh, against Britain. And a few battles, uh, a, a battles happened, and then, uh, the last one was at Mayuba when they uh, they won the battle at the um, Mount Mayuba. Um, that was the first bo uh, Boer War, Anglo-Boer War, and then it took us about almost 20 years when the second one started. But in that period, we know that a lot of other discoveries happened also after the minerals, and then of course we know that Britain also came again and tried to take that one. The, the second Boer War was uh, the, the bad one. Uh, and I think that's the one that, uh, you know, where, where, where the Russian volunteers also came to assist the Boers against uh, uh, the, 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 the British, who really started making war. Uh, really, uh, uh, war is bad, but I mean, the, they've, they've added an, uh, an extra element of concentration camps. And that uh, is an, you know, is an era or is an event that actually caused a lot of trouble, a lot of pain in our in our history. So if we look, if we look back at, at that at that uh, that period in time, but <clears throat> the other thing that I want to say is that it was only the Boers and the Zulus on the African soil that I'm aware of, and it might be in other colonial countries as well. The Boers and the Zulus that won the uh, they won battles against the British and defeated them properly. <clears throat> and uh, so the Boers were the second, the Zulus were actually the first. The Zulus said in 1877 at the Battle of Isandlwana, they basically destroyed the whole um, army of, of the British there. And then thereafter, it was um, the Boers in 18, 18, 18, 18, 1881, and then, of course, 18, 1899, the, the, the Second Anglo-Boer War um, started, and that one carried on for th almost three years. Um, I think 
And some of the historians say that was a, a war not won by the British and not lost by the Boers. But the, the, the main thing is there was a, uh, a, you know, we signed an agreement on the 31st of May 1902, where we say that's the, the new peace agreement. But <clears throat> if we want to talk about the Russian volunteers, uh, we, I, I just want to ask you from your side where you said, what role did the Russian volunteers play in the Anglo-Boer War and how significant do you think was their contribution <clears throat> uh, from a Russian perspective but also on the on the ground level, the uh, you know I read your book and I must uh, say to our viewers it's actually interesting. There's a book called A Russian on Commando, and this book is actually uh, a, a book that uh, was written by a Russian that was here and very interesting that this uh, this guy he wrote it. I can't remember in the 80s or you know in the 1900s uh, after that. And this was now translated to English. And um, uh, you, the, the, the main thing about this, this guy in the book, book said, to, uh, said to us that uh, he did not, uh, he, he wanted to, uh, th they did not come to tell the, tell the Boers how to fight. But to be quite honest, I think you guys knew, <laughs> knew better how to fight than us at that point in time. I think it was just a different environment, you know. Uh, the terrain was different, and that's the only thing that basically was different between uh, the, the the people back then, when they when they when they um, uh, fought one another in in, uh, in in this war. So, what what roles did you think do you think uh, did the Russian soldiers play in the Anglo-Boer War? From the military point of view, I'm not sure that I can assess uh, this. I'm, I'm in no position. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I can provide you with the context, and uh, it, it is important, uh, historically very important, I think, to understand uh, better uh, uh, what uh, are the relationship between our two peoples uh, based on. Uh, because we, uh, Russian society supported Boers in the war against the Brits. Um, but uh, later we have uh, found ourselves on uh, different sides of the bar barricades, so to speak. And um, uh, there is an explanation to this. It's a long story, though, that I, would, I can tell you if you have time. Go for it. Or, 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. I have time. I don't want to waste your time. You know, it's, you no, no, it's not a waste. By, by, by no means, this is yeah. a waste of time. No, certainly not. I'm, I'm very glad I, I, I have a listener to this who can bring it to, to the others because I think it, it is crucially important, actually. Mm. And many people do not understand this, do not know simply this. Uh, but um, again, uh, since uh, I have to go back in history somewhat because. Uh, uh, after the, we defeated the uh, Russian, uh, Russian uh, army, defeated Napoleon, and after the winter uh, campaign, uh, there was a surge, you know, in uh, national pride in, in uh, the Russian Empire, uh, also uh, caused by the very fact that the uh, Russian army liberated uh, many European countries uh, that were conquered by Napoleon. And uh, it was in March uh -huh. uh, 1814, 210 years ago, that Russian, Prussian, and other troops marched uh, in, into Paris, actually. Um, so that, that was this nice date recently, just a few days ago. Uh, but um, uh, Russians took pride in this, uh, and um, in, uh, uh, that there was a, right, a rise in these uh, patriotic sentiments and, you know, this heightened uh, sense of justice alongside sympathy uh, towards uh, oppressed people in different countries. And um, it went on for many years and sort of became a tradition, a, a, a mentality uh, of, of uh, peoples uh, of the Russian Empire and uh, later on in the USSR. 
Um, well, uh, first of all, um, I can refer to the sympathy uh, that uh, uh, grew on on the uh, to, to to other Slavic peoples, uh, and also on the basis of uh, religious. Uh, Mm -hmm. connotation, religious ties, because there were many Christians uh, suffering under uh, the Ottoman yoke in, uh, in Europe. And um, first I can refer to the uh, Greek uprising in 1821 um, against Ottomans that, that, that became like, you know, an all national project in Russia. And it, uh, the uh, assistance to the Greeks assumed different forms, from fundraising to uh, receiving multiple refugees from the Ottoman Empire in the southern Russian territories, mm. and uh, to, to direct participation in the hostilities uh, in, in the ranks of the insurgents. Um, and, uh, but the key event leading to the independence of Greece, actually, was the Russian-Turkish War of 1828-29. And that was, you know, uh, all this was riding this wave of sympathy. Uh, but then uh, you, you can take uh, other events in the Balkans uh, in 1875-76, uh, which became like a milestone, like a true milestone in Russia's volunteer movement. And that was after Serbia and Bulgaria declared war on the Ottoman Empire. And that also caused the wave of solidarity in Russia. And uh, lots of Russian volunteers went there. And that uh, was the, you know, the, the again, the high wave mm. uh, of, of uh, this volunteer movement in Russia because in Serbia, uh, there were detachments that were not predominantly, but almost exclusively Russian. And altogether, the number of volunteers there, fighting volunteers, exceeded 7,000. Cool. Uh, well, at that time, in 75-76, uh, war the Ottoman Empire prevailed. But then, uh, this, this uh, solidarity became part of the official foreign policy of the Russian Empire. In 1878, uh, Russia declared war on Turkey, and that uh, Turks, uh, Ottoman Empire suffered a crushing defeat on that. And as a result, uh, three uh, uh, states became independent. And that was Romania, Serbia, and, and Montenegro. And also part of Bulgaria received uh, some, some autonomy within the Ottoman Empire as a result of this war. Or if you would like to take um, uh, somewhat closer uh, to South Africa, uh, it's, it was Abyssinia. In 1896, there was a battle of uh, Adwa. Uh, and that was a crucial engagement uh, between the Ethiopians and, and Italian. Uh, colonist army. That, that was the first Italo-Ethiopian war, and uh, Africans prevailed, and they also had uh, Russian volunteers fighting on their side against the, the Italians. And um, I can go on telling you different stories about that, uh, like a Spanish Civil War, 1936-1939, when Soviet volunteers uh, took uh, part in the hostilities against the General Franco military that were supported by uh, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. And again, Republicans lost, unfortunately, at that time. But uh, it, it, uh, it was exactly the same uh, with uh, South Africa, with Anglo-Boer Wars. Mm -hmm. The Russians just felt that they couldn't stay aside. Uh, you know, we, we say about ourselves that we uh, live by heart. Uh, we should perhaps be more rational sometimes mm -hmm. uh, and follow the law. But uh, this, this, this uh, exaggerated sense of justice or injustice, it, it leads us sometimes uh, rather far away from our homes. And um, um, uh, th this is uh, what happened here, and uh, 
uh, it, it was actually not only the uh, volunteers who fought, and uh, you're right, maybe some of them uh, were better uh, in military sense, uh, because they were professional military, a lot of them. Uh, they, they were discharged, uh, you know, like vacationing, like now. Uh, sometimes we, we see the same phenomenon. Mm. Uh, Western military in Ukraine, in particular, uh, fighting on the side of Kiev regime. Um, so, uh, but but, but uh, there were also other uh, kinds forms of assistance, and we mentioned the two hospitals. But there is uh, one uh, particular thing that I would like uh, to, to, to raise with you, because uh, very few people in South Africa know it, uh, that um, uh, the secondary school for girls called Rania in Bloemfontein, it was established uh, and uh, it was uh, built and operated in early uh, 19, uh, 20th century, 1902 to 1917 until the great October Socialist Revolution, but it was built and operated on the, you know, the funds allocated by the uh, Russian Imperial Court. Well, <coughs> with the revolution, uh, funding uh, stopped, stopped uh, yeah. apparently, but mm. that was the initiative for orphaned girls, orphaned and war families during the, the Second Anglo Boer War. I understand. Uh, is that the Urania um, Macy School, the Urania Girl School? Or? Girl, girl School. Yeah, the Girl yeah. School. All oh, right. Very interesting what we now hear from Mr. Haragashov. The other, th other thing I want to say is, uh, yeah, I, I just want to, to you know, we are all, I, I have to finish off now, but um, we, I want to invite the, uh, the, the viewers from Skakers om hierdie boek te gaan lees. Dit is een baie interessante boek, A Russian on Commando. And then there's another book that I want to show you. You guys, is also Boere en Russe. Uh, in this one is, you know, it's a few letters uh, that was written. And it's a very colorful book, this one. Um, it's, in Af it's in English. No, it's in Afrikaans and, and Russian. So in Russian, you, yes. There's you, no English. Yes, there's no English. And this is not a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> not a mistake. <laughs> so there's, there you have it. You read it. This one is uh, Russian and this one is, uh, this side is English, uh, Afrikaans. So you can read it. It's actually some letters that was written and uh, what happened to, to, to the, to the Boer, Boer War, what happened in the Boer War. And afterwards, the, the friendships that was established after that, am I right? So, uh, so yes, I think so. Yes, uh, and, and this is just just uh, one of the elements that re is reflecting this relationship. I but uh, l l let me get back to the modern mm -hmm. times and say that the border war or the bush war, um, again, it is very important uh, mm -hmm. to understand. Mm -hmm. It was not uh, the war uh, between Russians and the Boers. Mm -hmm. Let's not confuse interstate relationship and a relationship between the two peoples. Absolutely. It was uh, the war um, uh, of the socialist system against uh, the f former colonial system and uh, against apartheid regime. And it so happened that uh, one of us was on one side and another one on the other side. But um, that, that shouldn't uh, be transferred uh, to you know, and should be allowed to spoil the relationship between the two peoples. Uh, we, we have, for example, this, uh, the veterans of Angola Union, the people who fought there, and uh, guess who their best friends are? It's the veterans of the, this uh, former Buffalo Battalion, the, this I know. number 61 uh, battalion group. So uh, let's not confuse this. Uh, let, let's let's uh, separate, uh, as we say in Russian, cutlets uh, on the one side, flies on the other. So please. <coughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> I, I just want to. Uh, I have to ask this question: Why did the National Party or the people back then call the Russia the Rui Gefar? Uh, the red danger. <laughs> well, I think that uh, it, it is because uh, there was this. Uh, confrontation between two systems, mm. socialist and capitalist, uh, colonial and, and socialism. And uh, in, uh, in USSR, 
uh, USSR was firmly on the side of the oppressed peoples, according to this ideology. Uh, and um, in particular, um, uh, what was perhaps uh, badly perceived in, in uh, South African Union, uh, that in 1960, it was uh, by the initiative of the USSR and uh, through the efforts of uh, its diplomats uh, that the declaration on granting uh, uh, independence to colonial uh, peoples and countries adopted by the United Nations. And that was the beginning of the process of, I mean, politically and uh, diplomatically, it was the beginning of the process of decolonization of Africa in particular. So yes, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, from that point of view, uh, it was a, a threat uh, to the then regime in, mm -hmm. in South Africa. <clears throat> Mr. Rogachev, I have so, mo uh, so much more questions and I want to say to our viewers, we want to talk about the multipolar system, we want to a little bit talk about how the world orders are busy changing, but we don't have time now. I definitely will see that we can have another thing, um, another, another interview where we can talk a little bit more that's closer uh, or currently happening. <clears throat> Maybe if we get another time, Mr. Rogoshov, then we, all these problems would have been solved. Or <laughs> we would have been wiped out of the of the earth, uh, you know, as as, as some of these um, news outlets are actually portraying this whole thing that we're entering a world war that somebody just needs to press a button, then the whole whole world will be uh, gone. Um, so I'm not gonna. Uh, to put you in that situation, but I want to say to you, thank you for the opportunity, and I hope that we can have another discussion. I think, to me, you've answered some of the difficult questions that was always a kind of like a barrier, something in between us. We couldn't, I couldn't talk to you properly, and uh, I think now we we know one a lot, one a little bit better. <clears throat> you can at least see that we from our side, we also. We just have our language, we have our culture, and we just want to respect, be respected, but also we want to respect others for that. Uh, thank you very much for that. I don't know if you want to have a last word for our viewers. Uh, no, I, I would like just to thank you for this, uh, for allowing me to express myself on uh, certain issues that I felt also were important uh, um, uh, for this audience in particular. And uh, come back soon. Let's have another uh, round. Actually, for the bye, donkey. Thank you. Спасибо.